Good evening, everyone. My name is Alicia Barrett. I'm with Benny's Beverage Depot. And uh, as you know, we are celebrating Black History Month and Benny's is honored to have Robin and Andrea McBride, founders of the largest Black-owned wine company now in the world. That's, that's correct, right, ladies, in the world? <laughs> yes, that's right. right. Uh, congrats on that. Um, McBride Sisters Collection, uh, raised on opposite sides of the globe. They have the most amazing story and we're excited to showcase their wines tonight. So Robin and Andrea, thank you so much for joining me. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. <laughs> so we we must start with with your story, which is which is truly incredible. Uh, can each of you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you met uh, in 1999? I believe that's right. That's when we met for the very first time. So although we were both born actually in Los Angeles to the same father, and we have two different mothers, I'm nine years older. I grew up in Monterey. So up the coast in California, nice, beautiful, picturesque little seaside community that also happens to be a place where we make amazing wines. Um, and my mom and dad, once they divorced, they had um, absolutely no contact with each other. So I didn't know him when I was growing up. I didn't know that nine years after my birth that um, a little sister would be born back in Los Angeles. And Andrea, um, born in LA, but her mom was originally from New Zealand. And um, her mom and our dad also ended up eventually splitting and divorcing. And her mom, unfortunately, had a terminal diagnosis, um, a cancer diagnosis, and decided to move back to her home country of New Zealand um, to be with her family. And Andrea was five, five or six years old at that time. And, her mom unfortunately passed away shortly after moving back to New Zealand. And so at that point, Andrea was also disconnected from our dad and from his family. And she didn't know that somewhere out in the world um, that she had a big sister. And it wasn't until uh, many years later that our dad was unfortunately ill himself, but his dying wish um, sort of was to family was to try to help him find to locate both of his daughters not quite sure where we were I had an idea Andrea might be in New Zealand I could still be in California um, and that even if he um, didn't survive for very long he wanted to make sure that both of his daughters knew about each other and that we were eventually connected and um it took quite a long time because this is back in the 90s and his family, of course, wanted to make sure that they um, kept his wish, but had to do it the old school way, right? So there was no Google and Facebook. You couldn't just type into your computer and find somebody. It took many, many years actually for them to find and locate both of us. And they found Andrea first in New Zealand. Um, and it took a few more years before they were able to locate me. I, it's it's such an incredible story. And so when you first um, met and were connected, how long did it take you to realize that, you know, you both grew up in world-class wine growing regions, you had an interest in wine. How What was that discussion like to decide to go into this industry? Because a lot of people want to go into wine, right? Um, right. Everyone, I think, you know, somewhere down the line, maybe has thought about it or, uh, you know, said says that it will be nice. But how did that conversation go? It was after the initial shock, <laughs> you know, and, and meeting, of the, you know, we met in the, in the airport and this was pre 9-11. So you could meet people at the gate and there were a lot of hugs and tears. And, and we went back to our cousin's house and uh, the natural first question uh, was, what was it like where you grew up? And really quickly, we figured out that we both grew up in these rural areas that were uh, world-class uh, winemaking regions. Um, my mum's family in New Zealand um, were humble farmers and were in Marlborough and Blenheim uh, in the time that it started to transition where, you know, people started talking about maybe planting this grape called Sauvignon Blanc and, you know, trying to see if, you know, uh, collectively, you know, they could sort of form a, a, a wine industry. And um, so my, my uncle, um, you know, planted some of the farmland that he had. And, um, and so I grew up um, 
you know, as soon as you're, you can pick things up and you're big enough, you know, in a farming family or um, you're free labor. So I was, you know, grew up um, uh, planting, you know, vineyards and, and rootstock and was so completely sure that I would never, ever be in the wine industry because, <laughs> you know, farming is, is difficult work and you're out in elements. Um, but the thing I think that I was attracted to the most about the wine industry is just the care and the love um, for a community of people that goes into taking care of these little berries um, for such a long period of time um, and then really handing them off and transitioning into this beautiful beverage that's really, you know, it's culture, uh, it's optimism in a glass. And usually when people are getting uh, together, uh, it's with food, it's a good time, it's family and didn't feel like, you know, had a really small family. And um, so I think on the outside looking, it was really attracted to that. And then um, unbeknownst to me, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, Robin was having the same experience uh, in Monterey and um, with with grape growing families and agricultural families in, in Monterey. And um, so we, we both sort of independently had these experiences we're really attracted to the, the winemaking community aspect of the business. And it was so serendipitous how we met um, that we felt like together we could kind of do anything, <laughs> you know, was, we were quite on a high, you know, in terms of like coming together and just felt so connected that when we met that uh, we, when we met, I was 16, Robin was 25. Um, it was life changing, obviously, um, but from then, I knew that I was going to go back to New Zealand, graduate, because uh, when we met, it was in the United States. Uh, I was going to graduate high school, come back to college to be closer to Robin. And really in that period of time, when I was at an university, I was going to university in Los Angeles at USC. Robin was in Monterey and halfway between LA and Monterey is, you know, you have Paso Robles, San Luis Obispo, you have Central Coast Wine uh, Country. And that's where we really started to kind of hatch our plans of, um, just talking out loud if we're going to start a winery like what would it look like what would it be like how would we do it and we felt like we had this really unique authentic opportunity to do something that no other winery in the world can do and that's grow and make wine in two different hemispheres yeah and was that a part of the discussion early on i mean what's cool about uh, drinking your wines is that you can you know head to new zealand and then come back to california uh, so you can kind of travel uh, with your portfolio uh, did you know immediately you were going to include both? Did kind of uh, actually buying land anywhere, you know, come into the conversation? Uh, how did your plans evolve, essentially? Well, we had two big challenges to start off with. <laughs> but to answer your question, yes, we felt like that um, what was cool about and authentic to our story was that you could travel between these two hemispheres, but it really was a reflection of how we drank and everybody sort of our, our girlfriends and people around us drink quite promiscuous you know we want to change it up every night we don't want to drink the same thing every night and so we felt like there was something to that um but we didn't know how to make wine and we had no money um <laughs> you know so two two pretty, pretty big problems and so we figured out that the best place was to start was to learn the business of wine and um the the least capital and sort of intensive place to start in terms of a wine business was to obtain an importer's license, a federal importer's license. And, you know, I think it was $1,800. Robin always corrects me because she's the, the keeper. It of was the $1,895. <laughs> 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 um, and, um, and so we figured that we could import in California, you know, you can self-distribute. Um, and we went down to some growers that we knew in New Zealand and said, don't put all your eggs in our basket, but we think that we can help, you know, grow your brand and sell your brand on premise in California. And the deal was, is that every vintage, we would go down to New Zealand, be a part of Harvest, they would teach us how to make wine. And so our ultimate goal was to start there and small, and then eventually one day graduate to where we could launch our wine company. That's, that's amazing. And just starting with uh, an importer's license and now the largest uh, black and wine company in the world. So uh, much to celebrate and talk about as we start with the wines. And so for those tasting along, uh, I hope I hope you've been uh, enjoying a glass, uh, but we are gonna start with the Chardonnay, the, Mc the McBride sisters Chardonnay here. And I, I believe we have a, a slide on this wine that 
we can have put up for us as we talk about uh, the Chardonnay. And this is from the Central Coast. Uh, so perhaps you, could, you guys can walk us through this wine and also maybe share some of your approaches to winemaking. What has inspired you and your philosophy um, in making this wine? Yeah. So uh, for Robin, and this is Robin's backyard, maybe I'll talk about the philosophy and then she can get into the details um, of, of this wine. Um, but just in our studies and um, our haunting passion when it comes to the world of wine, uh, we find, uh, found ourselves pretty, pretty early in France um, and having a lot of respect for philosophically um, uh, French um, uh, growing styles and winemaking techniques and really taking on um, uh, this ideal that we are the stewards of the winemaking process um, and really it's starting in the vineyard and at the very least sustainably farming and trying to be as integrated as you can with the ecosystem, um, you know, with cover crops and, um, you know, just minimal um, uh, spraying and, and utilizing different insects and different things to treat pests and, and, and stuff like that. And obviously too around water and, um, and people and community, which is a big part of sustainability. Um, and so um, we like to think that we draw and we're inspired by the old world. Um, and, but we feel like that we bring new world freshness, <laughs> new world perspective. Obviously we're growing in the new world. Um, you know, we, we like to look at, look at everything through our rose colored lens, our lenses. Um, and so um, for us and, and for the Chardonnay, and, and I have to say this for me, like I was totally an ABC person, <laughs> anything but Chardonnay. <laughs> um, <That's> and, <laughs> and, that was, and that was until, um, until I started um, tasting some, um, some different Chardonnay um, in the southern part of Burgundy. Yeah. Uh, and it really sort of opened my eyes up to, um, you know, the expression of the grape and and what you could do and and how you can make it really beautiful without having to have a, a huge amount of oak influence on the wine. Um, but Robin, if you want to talk a little bit about in the valley, yeah, and sound a yeah. Bit. of course, of course. So um, yeah, kind of going along with our philosophy and the style of wines that we love to make, um, the history and the heritage of the old world and how how those wines are made. And figure, for us, figuring out a way to combine that, combine that with sort of the um, finesse, if you will, of uh, grapes that are grown in the New World. And so, coming from the Central Coast, growing up in Monterey, always very much appreciated the influence of cool climate, um, growing regions, influence of the morning fog, um, and the inland valleys. And so, when we decided to make a Chardonnay, we wanted to make sure that for any of those ABC people out there, that this could be a wine that they appreciated. And of course, we didn't want to over manipulate it. We didn't want to use a whole bunch of really heavy, you know, oak and things that covered up the beauty of this, what's really a beautiful grape that people had, I think, started to appreciate it a little bit less just because of some of the, the way that the styles were trending that they were being made, which was buttery, which was heavy, heavy had a lot of oak influence and at times, you know, you can really barely even taste the grapes through all of that um, winemaking. So this is from um, Edna Valley. So that's again, cool, cool climate, a valley. It's got a few little volcanoes that are spread along the way, um, has the influence of the Pacific Ocean. So really great acidity, long growing season, really, really beautiful acidity. We use a little bit of um, fermented on oak, so um, neutral barrels and French oak, about half of it. And we wanted to do that just to kind of give it a little bit of creaminess, give it a little bit of that sort of uh, vanilla characteristic that you might get, but in no way overshadow the, the beautiful crispness of the wine itself. And so of course this wine, you know, a, a good Chardonnay is gonna show you lots of green apple, it's gonna show you, you know, stone fruit, citrus, um, um, a little bit of maybe nectarine, and then just finish off with kind of that nice roundness, but have that really beautiful acidity. One of the things, or a couple of the things for all of the wines that we make, we always wanna make sure, one, we want all of our wines to be really aromatic. We want them to express themselves. As soon as you put it in the glass, you get all of these beautiful characteristics on the nose. And then two, wines that are um, great for food pairings. 
So um, for a wine like a Chardonnay, a lot of times it's a little bit more tricky to pair if you have all of this butter and oak and things that are going on. This has got that beautiful acidity and crispness and pairs with a really, really wide um, variety of foods. And obviously you can go from veggies. Our favorite is seafood. Um, we love oysters, we love scallops, we love seafood to go with this wine. And we think it's just a beautiful expression yeah. of the Central Coast. Crab, yeah. shrimp, <laughs> scallops. <laughs> Uh, well, now I want a seafood tower uh, following, <laughs> yes. this, uh, following this call. I, I couldn't agree more, though, with the refreshing characteristic of this wine. The really nice acidity that accompanies the fruit concentration. And you're right, a lot of people, they did. They fell out of love with Chardonnay. They think it's a pretty, like, uh, a great variety that can only express itself in that um, kind of heavily oaked, full, you know, malolactic fermentation, really creamy, really rich style. And it's just not true. Chardonnay can take on so many different forms depending on the climate and the winemaking choices. And you've done exactly, um, I think, what you've just outlined in terms of this beautiful finesse, but a nod to the old world in terms of restraint on oak usage, um, but still uh, it's there and giving some nice structure to the wine, uh, but, but really, really pretty. And that's what's great too about the Central Coast, as you're saying, there's so many cooling influences uh, sometimes we just think California and warm, but you're right, we have the fogs in the valley and a lot of breaks in the coastal mountain range that allow you to grow beautiful fruit that retain acidity in the long growing season. So uh, lovely Chardonnay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, next up, we're going to uh, head across the Pacific. And I will say uh, for everyone watching um, here on Zoom, please uh, share your questions so we can ask Robin and Andre at the end of our time or throughout our conversation um, in the chat function or in the Q&A, we'd love to hear from you um, or just share comments about the wines if you're tasting along. Uh, we're going to now cross the Pacific uh, and head to Marlboro and Andrea, it's crazy when you first opened and were sharing that, uh, you know, that you were growing up there before kind of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc was even the thing. And that's just crazy to think about. And though vines, you know, arrived in New Zealand in kind of the latish 19th century, the modern era is, is you know, started in really, I guess, the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, but really didn't catch on right till the 90s. So uh, yeah, tell us about the Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc here that we have. Uh, it's it's so perfectly Marlboro when I when I was tasting it before this before this uh, call. Yeah, it's really you know when I when I got to New Zealand, you know Blenheim, the town uh, in Marlborough, uh, you know really small country town, and you would fly in. It's at the top of the southern island um, of New Zealand, and you would see farmland everywhere. You know now now you fly in, and it's just rows and rows of vineyard, stainless steel tanks. Um, you know, there's no more parts of the land. It is like the industry, um, you know, in Marlborough. And um, in Marlborough, we have two main valleys. We have the Wairau Valley, which is the northern older part of Marlborough. And then we have the Awatere Valley, which is the southern part um, of Marlborough. And you get really two um, distinctive styles um, out of these two regions. The Awatere is a, a little bit cooler. It's um, more exposed. Um, and so you get uh, the Sauvignon Blanc grapes that you, that you can grow there, um, super edgy, racy acidity, um, um, a lot of sort of green capsicum, um, sort of sweaty armpits. I know that doesn't sound that great, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, descriptors that get used for this area. Um, and um, versus in the Wairau Valley where it's a little bit warmer and you have the Wairau River that comes through the valley and kind of um, creates a sort of natural um, warming and sort of heating like on the vineyards where um, you get more of a tropical spectrum. Um, and this is the style that, that Robin and I um, like to make. And it's, we're really trying to kind of show, showcase a really full spectrum. So with our Sauvignon Blanc, we want you to be able to get um, lemon lime zest, you know, red grapefruit, um, a little bit of stone fruit um, and passion fruit. And, and just really trying to show, I guess, maybe some, some, um, some, some grape growing canopy skills to kind of get that, that full spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but also too, um, in the Northeastern part of the water re region, um, there's, a, there's a fleshiness that comes, that we're able to achieve um, with the grapes that we grow there. And um, so uh, this small Sauvignon Blanc, 100% stainless steel, um, it's, you know, uh, it, 
gives you that full spectrum of flavor. Um, it's Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, so it's going to punch you in the nose. You don't even need to get close. <laughs> um, yes, it's very aromatic, uh, but exactly, <laughs> exactly what you want, right, from Marlboro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked your comment as well with the fleshiness. Um, sometimes it, um, they can lack kind of some, um, yeah, some fleshiness, some body, uh, some interest and be really lean. And while this is still, you know, it's a crisp Sauvignon Blanc as you expect it, there's still a lot of fruit here and, mm -hmm. it, and it hangs around for a while. Uh, so another, and another gorgeous food wine as well. Yes, yes. Always, always <laughs> that. <laughs> I, I'm curious um, what each of your kind of go-to wine is um, of your of your collection. If you were to just grab one bottle, what would it be? It's like, for me, it changes. It changes yeah. all the time. We always say it's such a hard answer, a hard question to answer because it's like your kids and you feel like they can hear you <laughs> saying it that you have a favorite. Um, but it really does. I think I spend more time with some than others. For me, right now, it's actually our red blends. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's 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 been my go-to lately. For me right now, it's the um the Central Coast Chardonnay, the 2018. I think it's just a lovely, beautiful wine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a question here from Courtney, and we talked a little bit about uh, when you kind of started the business, um, some mm -hmm. challenges you faced, but uh, she asked, can you share more about how your marketing strategy developed and has evolved over time? and how you integrated your story in that, in the marketing and branding. Yeah, um, I think uh, for us, it was, you know, obviously like we are the McBride sisters um, and I felt like, and Robin felt like um, we had opportunities to um, create sub brands that are very authentic to who we are, um, but really kind of, zeroed in on um, a passion point, if you will. So you can see like with respect to she can, you know, that is us like fervently, you know, unapologetic about advancing women and, you know, our, our feminist viewpoint <laughs> on the world, you know, um, and, and really combining innovation of the quality um, of our bottled wines in the can. And, and then also to supporting our philanthropic efforts. And then with Black Girl Magic, um, uh, that really came about when two years, I'm trying, two years ago, Robin, or three years ago? Yeah, no, it's 20, well, yeah, summer of 2018. Um, we got invited to Essence Festival in New Orleans. And um, for those that don't know Essence Festival, over a three-day period, it's, um, for the most part, um, it's a music celebration and an empowerment celebration. And it's, um, I think, the largest um, festival in America and it's predominantly black women and that year there was like a whole bunch of black girl magic going on whether it was like women becoming judges or um, you know or like in entertainment uh, in the business world and it was the first time that New Orleans had a black woman mayor and so Rob and I thought well let's create like a commemorative label that really captures what's going on here and um, when we're kind of ideating and thinking about what type of wine um, we would want to make and what she would what she would look like and smell like and taste like, um, we we started to think about like like great like um, you know uh, white wines in the Alsace and or like Mosul and so we landed on um, sort of modeling you know um, some of the the beautiful off dry rieslings that we love um, from that part of the world and. So we created this label, we made this beautiful, you know, off dry um, Riesling, the fruit from like Monterey. And we, we got to this, um, got to Essence Festival and it was, uh, we hosted with the mayor of New Orleans this opening party for the festival. And we've never had in our lives people react to <laughs> our wine label and packaging and wines um, like we did it, like the woman did at Essence Festival. And it was such a beautiful celebration, um, this woman you know, celebrating each other, drinking wine. And obviously agriculture takes a little bit of time. So um, Rob and I at that moment thought to ourselves, we should, you know, turn this into a range. And um, and so we did that uh, in 2020, we launched the, the Black Girl Magic range um, to add, we added the, the red blend, um, we added the rosé and then the sparkling fruit to that range. And um, 
it was also too one of those things where we felt like there weren't a lot of wine companies that were marketing to black women and we are black women and we wanted to um, shine a light on black women and celebrate with black women and um, help them on their wine journey and 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 that was the essence of creating that brand so I think it's like McBrothes is who we are and then we sort of have these offshoots of things that, that we're really passionate about and that's how She Can came to life and Black Girl Magic came to life. Uh, thank you and you know I think I read too when you launched Black Girl Magic uh, and you alluded to kind of how popular it was but it was received so well demand was so high and you just kind of even just struggled to keep up with the demand because uh, it's doing so well. And uh, someone did ask about kind of what other wines of yours that, that we carry at Benny at Benny's. Um, in reference to the Black Girl Magic line, we do have the Sparkling Brute that Andrea just mentioned um, and the Rosé. So obviously inventory will vary by store, but uh, give your local store a call and uh, they can source that for you. Uh, so let's transition then to uh, the Black Girl Magic Red, uh, which we're having here, the Red Blend um, from the, uh, a, a few a few different areas here. We're going to, I think, Paso and Monterey on this, right? For the That's great right. Okay. That's right. Take it back to, to my part of the world, to the Central Coast. Um, so this red blend, yes, is from both of those areas, labeled Central Coast, but the it's about 60, 67 or so percent Merlot. The Merlot is from Monterey, um, and about 30, 33 or so percent um, Cab, and that's from Paso, from the Estrella District. And again, um, you know, our goal is to really showcase the beauty of this fruit um, and our yeah, appreciation. But at the same time, but at the same time, like this wine is definitely like, you know, we like to talk about like Black Girl Magic being a maxim maximalist. So for us, this is like opulent, decadent, big, <laughs> you know, um, and, and we love um, the right bank of Bordeaux. Um, so we like more Merlot heavy. Um, lens than Cabernet Sauvignon blends. Sorry, Robin, keep going. <laughs> okay. um, so that being said, um, pretty powerful fruit in here <laughs> from the Merlot and from the Cab. We are, but we're again trying to bring that out. We're trying to express um, that fruit. So a lot of people who um, are Cab drinkers or who are accustomed to Napa or other California style reds that have a whole lot of oak um, that's used in the fermentation we shied away from that, but it does have um, quite a, a bit of beautiful French oak in it. So from the Merlot, we're getting all of those really pretty, you know, sort of cherry and chocolatey flavors and make it kind of dessert-like. And then with the cab, um, you've got that structure and you've got the body from the tannins and the bigger fruit that comes out from there. We call it, we've got mixes of, you know, plum, cherry, blackberry, raspberry, all of these different layers, all of this complexity that's all in one bottle. Um, I, I always, I like to call it like my blackberry cobbler. To me, it's like a dessert. Um, it's got some pretty good acidity as well. It's got some great structure and some great tannins, which you can drink it by yourself. So it's not a super gritty, super heavy um, red that you're going to have to age for a long time or you're going to have to burn a steak to eat with it. You can sit out on your porch, you can sit on your couch, you know, and drink it with a movie. But again, with that acidity, being from California, from the Central Coast, having that cooling influence of the Pacific Ocean right there. You've got that great acidity. You can pair it with a million different dishes or enjoy it by itself. Yeah, you know, Merlot is also a grape that I feel has been misunderstood. And, Absolutely. and there, there's legitimate reasons, you know, a little bit ago, some overplanting, some, some poor quality. Uh, maybe you know two decades ago but but it's improved so much and it, and, and it is a beautiful grape variety Absolutely. Um, it really is. And, we and, agree. okay good all right we agree we're, all we're, we're on a mission to change that bad perception you know and i think especially in the new world you know there's definitely times um in california and the other new world winemaking regions where sort of commercialization and mass production and, you know, not the greatest winemaking and grape growing practices have been used. And unfortunately, sometimes certain grapes kind of get a bad rap because of the way that they were done and they fall out of favor a little bit. Um, but all of, you know, this is a great grape on its own. So it's our, our mission to showcase it and to bring people back, show them how beautiful this wine really is. Yeah, and I would just say too, like Robin, you know, she's talking about 
all of the, the predominantly black fruit um, and blue fruit that's in this wine. So, you know, the black plums, black cherries, blackberries, and she's talking about blackberry cobbler, but this is a completely dry wine. Mm -hmm. So there's, she's talking about the fruit profile, like there's no sweetness. So just want to make sure people don't expect to think to, they're going to have a, a, a sweet wine, a blackberry <laughs> cobbler, sweeter sort of wine experience. It's, it's not a sweet it's, bread. It's no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful purity of fruit, but fermented dry uh, yeah. for sure. So a lot of questions coming in and many have asked, um, and you're drinking along right now with the Black Girl Magic Rug Blend. And they're asking what the difference is in terms of the blend uh, and perhaps just the style compared to the McBride Sisters Red Blend. And which we do carry, by the way, uh, just to go back to that question, call your local store, but McBride Sisters Red Blend um, and the and the fruit rosé too. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I would say you might have a different opinion, Andrea, but I would say that the Black Girl Magic Red Blend just has a louder personality. Um, so it's, so the McBride Sisters collection is similar in that it is predominantly Merlot based, um, but the Black Girl Magic Red has just a little bit more, it has our, 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 our hand-selected fruit, higher quality, more expressive, and then we let it um, we let it age a little bit longer. It spends a little bit more time on oak and develops more of that complexity and more of those flavors and gives you more of that um, secondary the vanillas and the and the mochas and those hoppy flavors that um, that combine with the rest of that beautiful amazing fruit. She's just and, more of like the life of the party. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and with the collection, you know, the collection for us is it's really kind of like our Epicurean. Um, you know, wine. So it's like super, super food friendly. And um, personally, Robin and I, uh, we tend to gravitate towards, um, you know, reds that are light bodied reds and, and medium bodied reds. So I'd say like the McGrath's collection, red blend, I would describe as medium bodied, maybe a, like in between medium, medium plus. Medium I would plus. say, yeah, I would say like Coral Magic Red Blend, I would say maybe um, medium plus plus. Um, not quite like you know um like really yeah, you wouldn't say a full full body no i wouldn't um right. but but it's definitely a level above the, the collection um and so um i think i think that the collection's a little bit um more restrained um and um and just kind of brings sort of like a different different perspective um and different experience um with with the same great varieties um just um, express kind of in a different way. I think different. it nod, nods a little harder to the old world. Where yeah. I think um, with the uh, Black Girl Magic Red, we're really pulling out, we're really showcasing that California fruit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, commenting question here from uh, Liz, who's watching, she commented that your Chardonnay is dangerously delicious. <laughs> Love that. Uh, she asked if, uh, and, and this was mentioned briefly earlier, when you started going back to Marlborough, once you decided that uh, you got your importer's license, you were going to start bringing uh, wine over, and they were teaching you there. So uh, in terms of your wine knowledge, was it kind of all on the job? Uh, was there any kind of formal enology school? Um, yeah, how did you gain all of this, this expertise? The school of life. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely um, pure entrepreneurs in that sense and pure wine entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, learning, learning as we went um, and just soaking up as much information and experience as we could with anybody that would, that would give us access. <laughs> let, us hang out with us let, let us hang out for a little while. And it was funny, we actually, like 13 years into being uh, business owners in the wine industry, we went and uh, took the WSET um, courses. We took one, one, two, and three, and we'd already been, you know, owners in the business, like at that point, people were like, why, like, why are you doing that now? What's the point? But for us, it's really, you know, there's so much theory and everything else that's in there. And it helped for us to be able to broaden our um, knowledge and our experience, because at that point, we're been very focused on two specific regions where we produce wines and we went into really broad in that and a formal education setting was what, what worked for us. Yeah. Uh, uh, just, just briefly, would you mind mentioning, we have a question in about your sparkling wine. Uh, if you just want to share the bridles uh, that you use um, in both the McBride sisters, uh, you have the fruit um, and the rosé, and then also um, the Black Girl Magic. 
Yeah, so the McBride Sisters collection uh, sparkling brew is from Hawke's Bay, and that's some um, traditional sparkling varieties, so Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, um, and um, a little bit more he heavy handed with uh, the Pinot Noir. And when Rob and I were um, ideating around the collection and, and trying to think about what was going to be like the second variety out of New Zealand, which was a little bit tricky, you know, because New Zealand's not really known for um, another really strong variety. We could start to see the trends of rosé. We could start to see the trends of Prosecco, Cava, you know, sparkling from all these different places. And people just really love the fruit forwardness of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. And so that, that kind of um, pushed us into trying something a little bit different um, that, that no one's really sort of pioneered in New Zealand. I think now we might be the biggest producer like in the US of New Zealand sparkling. Um, and, um, and we're glad because it's, it's just turned out to be such a beautiful wine. But to ask the question, it's, it's Pinot and it's Chard and then um, and the McBread Sisters um, Brute. Um, it's a little, it, it's a little bit secretive. So it's, it's majority Chardonnay but we have like a, a little secret because uh, Rob and I um, uh, it's really proprietary. <laughs> Rob and I like better than secret <laughs> yeah, um, Rob and I really love Shannon. We really love like sparkling Shannon, and so we were trying to, um, you know, express our version from that that part of the world um, to give something that had a little bit more of a sort of a tropical um, than the green apple sort of traditional, um, you know. Uh, descriptors and, and flavor profile that you get from Chardonnay and sparkling. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, a wonderful uh, lineup we're going to put on the screen here, the slides of, or the wines rather that we tasted tonight. Uh, thank you both for shaking up the industry, for bringing such fantastic wines to all of us. And uh, especially thank you for your time tonight and sharing your story. Uh, so all that are watching, please uh, visit your local Binnie's um, travel the hemispheres, stop in New Zealand, stop in the Central Coast and uh, purchase your McBride Sisters wines and uh, the Black Room Magic collection. Uh, really, really appreciate you both. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. It was lovely. Thank you. We're going to do it again soon, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, Kelsey, if you wouldn't mind throwing up that final slide for us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your support. And uh, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> cheers.